So as we're collecting uh, the offering at this time, some of you may be wondering, Steve, why is it that you always call Easter the best day of the year? It's a good question. Why is this? Well, to answer that question, we've got to go back a little bit in time. We have to go back to the, the day that we celebrated just a few days ago, Good Friday. On the cross, when Jesus died, the Bible tells us that God placed all of our sins and all the consequences of our sins upon Jesus himself. And you know, he felt the way that we often do. He felt alone, ignored, forsaken, disappointed, depressed, empty, hurt. He felt all those things and more. He entered into our brokenness, we might say. And he did it so that he might bring us eternal life. On the crosses that are behind me here, you'll see different words Words that describe some of the pain that we feel in our life, don't we? And the kind of pain that Jesus might have endured for us. Those sins and the consequences of sin that he died to carry away. I call these Good Friday words meaningless, chaos, untrusting, guilt, blame, emptiness. What do these words mean for us? Why are they up there on these crosses? Well, just check this out on the screens. This is the story of all of us. We all have our brokenness, don't we? We all experience, to some extent, the brokenness of this world. We ourselves have done wrong things to others, and others have certainly done wrong to us. And so brokenness is part of our lives. It's part of our journey. Not long ago, I visited a man who was dying a friend suggested that I should talk to him and maybe, you know, he should see a pastor, so I went by his house. When I walked in and I saw the condition that he was in, I was absolutely shocked. His legs were black. He was bent over, his head resting on a pillow, doubled over with pain. In a voice that could scarcely whisper, I had to lean in close just to hear him speak, this old man confided in me that he was absolutely filled with fear. You see, for almost all of his life, since he was a little kid, he was fearful. He could even remember the day that fear entered his existence and took control. And now that death was staring him in the face, he felt more fear than he'd ever felt. What could I do? What hope could could I give this man who was just days, maybe just hours away from his demise? I whispered back in this man's ear that Jesus Christ died on a cross for his sins. Jesus entered into all of our brokenness that we might be forgiven. I talked about the body of Christ that was broken for him, the blood of Christ that was shed to take away all of his sins, I told him that Jesus carried all his sins and the consequences of those sins away when he died on the cross for his sake. And then I invited him to give his life to Jesus that he might receive the free gift of God's forgiveness by faith. And he did. He did. Right there and then, in a whisper, he told God that he was sorry for the wrong things he'd done. He thanked Jesus for dying for his sins and committed the rest of his life, what little there was left, to getting to know Jesus better. And then, rather than just sort of tell him about this relationship that's so amazing, I led him in a little prayer so that he might actually experience that relationship himself. I prayed, Father, would you show my new friend with the eyes of his heart something that he needs to see? How could you encourage him? I said, do you see anything? He, prayed, he said, I see a bright light. Now I see Jesus. I said, do you see his face? He says, yes. What's the look on his face? He's so calm. Is Jesus saying anything to you? Yes. What? He says, I don't need to be afraid anymore. For the first time in this man's life, he didn't have to be afraid. For the first time since childhood. And I asked him, do you think Jesus really spoke to your heart? And he said, I don't know. I said, well, there's only so many options. Do you think that's something you yourself would tell you? 
Would you say to yourself, I don't have to be afraid? He said, no. He says, I've never said that in my life. Right. That's what I thought. I said, so, do you think that's something the devil would tell you? No. Then who talked to you in your heart? I guess it was Jesus. I guess it was. I asked Jesus if he had anything else to say to this new child of God. He said, I I think he says that he loves me. I said, how do you feel about that? And he described a, a strange fluttering feeling in his heart that he had never felt before. And all of a sudden I realized, it dawned on me, he's never felt the love of God in his heart until this very moment. And so that day, an old broken down man, very near death, realized he does not have to be defined by brokenness anymore. He does not have to be afraid. We listened a little bit more in in, in prayer, and Jesus went on to tell him that he's prepared a place where there's going to be no more suffering and no more pain and nothing then left to fear. And then, for the next few days, this man lived with a hope that he never thought was possible. And now for an eternity, he will experience a hope that will go beyond his wildest imaginations for Just a few days later, this gentleman passed from the presence of his family and friends and into the arms of the one who said, I love you, who promised that you've got nothing to fear. He went from life to death in the twinkling of an eye. He he closed his eyes on this side of eternity, and he opened them looking directly into the eyes of his Savior and Lord. My friends, what hope do we have for our brokenness Speaking of Jesus, the Bible says he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was placed on him, and by his wounds we are healed. When he died on the cross on Good Friday, Jesus took all our sins upon himself, experienced even the consequences of sin as well, pierced, crushed, wounds, punishment was placed on him. The other consequences as well, emptiness, loneliness, disappointment, even fear. He entered into our brokenness in order that we might have the hope of forgiveness and love. As we enter now into this time of communion, let us come to the bread that represents the body that was broken for you. Let us come now and drink from the cup that represents that blood that was shed for your sins. Let us cling to this hope that our sins have been forgiven, our eternity is secure. And let us remember that these words up here, meaningless, chaos, untrusting, guilt, blame, emptiness, and fear, even fear, these things do not have to define our lives because we're in Christ. If you can come to the Lord's table, come. Come if you know Jesus as your Savior. Come and take the bread and cup. Hear the words, the body of Christ broken for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. Take these elements back to your seat. Eat and drink in remembrance of Jesus when you're ready. If you'd like to give uh, to our Compassion Fund, there are baskets that are there for you to do so. But let us celebrate the forgiveness that belongs to us because of Jesus' death on the cross. Would you uh, stand with me as we pray? Let's pray. And so, Heavenly Father, we come before you thanking you for this act of remembrance. Thanking you that these words of brokenness no longer define us in Christ. Thanking you that we stand before you covered in the blood of Jesus, pure and spotless in your sight. As our eyes are bowed as our head as as our uh, sorry our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed it may be that there would be one person here who would like to participate in communion as a brand new christian to receive that free gift of god's forgiveness and it's a simple thing it's profound but it's it's profound in its simplicity that you would pray you would pray to god that you might pray lord jesus i acknowledge that i'm a sinner
Why don't we all do that at this time? Just confessing any sin that comes to mind. Let us bring it and receive God's mercy, God's grace afresh at this moment. Just say, oh God, I'm sorry. For those who would like to receive God's gift of forgiveness, this is an opportunity for you in your heart of hearts to simply pray, Jesus, I believe that you died for my sins. Thank you. And then you can pray a prayer of commitment. Just pray in your heart. I give my life to follow you. I want to get to know you. Father, we just ask now that this time of communion would be represented by hope and that you would fill us with your strength and presence. In Christ's name, amen. I love these stories, and I know you love them as much as I do. It's uh, just amazing. This is what Easter is about. It is the triumph of hope over brokenness. Jesus was broken. He triumphed. You too. You too. Praise God. For the Bible says in Romans chapter 6, just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live now a new life. This is truth. So let us celebrate today that there's a new life available to us because Jesus not only died for our sins, but he went on three days later to rise from the dead. That same power that raised Christ gives us new life. Have you ever had someone go before you and do something that you thought was impossible? And that gave you kind of a hope that maybe you could do that same thing? When I was in high school, my buddies and I would often go to a national park up on the Bruce Peninsula to swim and climb rocks and hike and jump off cliffs. One place we would go to is called the Grotto. It's a cave that was cut into the limestone cliffs. Now, I had grown up not far from there in Owen Sound, and I had heard all the tragic stories about the Grotto. Because you see, underneath the water at the back of the cave, there was an under water tunnel that led out into the cold waters of Georgian Bay, out of the cave below. You could see the glow of sunlight under the water, and it reminded us of the horror stories. Not sure how many were true, but of those who had tried to swim it and didn't make it and had perished. My friends and I would never dare to swim through the grotto for those reasons alone. One day, a friend of mine named Chris, he didn't know better, he was new to the area. It was the first time that he'd been there. He would just moved from Saskatchewan. He had never heard the stories. And so he just saw it and swam through the tunnel and out into Georgian Bay. He just did it. Now, later that day, I bumped into him, and he was telling me about it. And I'm like, no, no, you didn't. No way. You must have been somewhere else. No, no, I did. Seriously, I'm not kidding. So I said, oh, yeah? Prove it. I, I'm a nice friend. <laughs> and so I went with him to the grotto that day, and uh, I watched as he donned a mask and flippers, and, and then he uh, took some deep breaths, and then he plunged down, and I watched him swim out of sight. And I thought, oh, boy, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but then he came around the other side and said, look, it, I survived. I did it. And then he said, Steve, you can do it too. Me? I was afraid. But Chris promised that he would go with me. He said, don't worry. He says, I'll go right in front of you. I'll be with you the whole way. I've done this before. All you've got to do is follow me. So we went into the depths of the cave, donned our masks, put on our flippers nice and tight, you know, took a few deep breaths, and then we took the plunge together. It was exhilarating. It was exciting because I didn't die. <laughs> and I couldn't wait after that to tell people, hey, this can be done. You could do it too. I became like a grotto evangelist. You can do it. 
And some of them did as I led the way, but others were too scared, and they, they stood there and they shivered in the back of the cave. You know, in much the same way, Jesus is someone who went before us and he did what we would love to do. We were stuck in our brokenness, entrenched in worries and fears and what ifs. We were paralyzed by our histories and our hang-ups. Many of us convinced that we would never be able to change anything, that it's only going to get worse. A new life is impossible. But then we met Jesus. And at Easter, we celebrate that Jesus went ahead of us. He did what we thought we could never do. He carried all of our sin, all of our guilt and shame, entered into our brokenness fully, enduring our hurts and hang-ups. He carried our insecurities. He experienced all of that and more. He even endured that which we fear the most, death itself. But here's the deal. He didn't stay dead. He defeated sin and all of the results of sin as well. He was risen into a brand new resurrected life. Glorious. And then he came to us in our brokenness and he said the most amazing words in our hearts. He said, if you follow me, you can do it too. This is why Easter is such an amazing day. It's the best day of the year because just as Christ was raised from the dead, so you too can live a new life. Not only did Jesus die, go ahead of us in defeating death and sin, he gave us his Holy Spirit inside so that he would go through the tunnel with us. This is what we celebrate at Easter. In Jesus, we have more than just a great example of sin and death defeated. We also have him now as our partner for life. He will go through whatever tunnel we face with us if we'll follow like my friend Chris swimming with me through that tunnel, leading the way, Jesus will go through life with you. It will not be easy. And we won't do it perfectly, I must add. But with him leading the, leading the way, as we follow, he will give us a new life. It will be an adventure that is filled with hope. From meaninglessness to purpose. From chaos to more increasing stability. From untrusting to greater levels of being unafraid, from guilt to more and more freedom, from blame to increasing love, from empty to a cup that overflows, from fear to greater levels of confidence in Christ. And even when, like that old man I met with that day, even when you pass through the tunnel of death itself, Jesus says, I will be with you. His comforting presence will be with us as he whispers to our heart, fear not, for I am with you always. Something that we've been doing here with our communion services since last fall is to open up these communion stations so that you can come forward for anointing with oil and for prayer. If there's just anything that you need at all that we could pray for, come forward. If there's a weakness that you experience in your own life, if there's a challenge that you or someone has in your family, come. If you know someone that you would love to get prayed for, come and let's pray for them. If there's just anything at all that you would like to be prayed for, don't leave before you give us the honor of praying for you. And so during this next set of worship, please feel free to come forward to the communion stations for prayer. Have you ever had someone go before you, doing something you thought you could never do, giving you the hope that perhaps you could do it too? Jesus is that person. What brokenness are you experiencing these days? Whatever it is, Jesus has beaten it. Death could not hold him down. And because Jesus has been raised from the dead, you too can live a new life. Let's stand and pray. Let's give him the glory. Oh, Lord Jesus, our heart sings with gratitude for all that you've done for us. Lord, we know that we're not where we want to be. We know, Lord, that we're not where we could be, but we thank you that we're not the person we used to be. Thank you for new life. Thank you for the triumph of hope over brokenness at Easter. 
Now, Father, we come before you in your presence to give you the praise, honor, and glory that you deserve. We pray for those who come forward now for prayer, that you would minister to them, strengthening, encouraging, and comforting them in their heart. And send us out of this place, Father, with the hope and excitement of Easter deeply rooted therein. In Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's worship him.